Why do dry January when you can do sweaty January? This year, jumpstart your fitness goals with $500 off Peloton Bike, Bike Plus, or Tread packages. Choose the package that will take your training to the next level with accessories like our cycling shoes, heart rate band, non-slip grip dumbbells, and more. All access membership separate. Offer ends January 8th, 2023. Excludes Bike, Bike Plus, and Tread Basics. See additional terms at OnePeloton.com. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. On our Facebook group, Arlene Westhoven wrote, After certain gatherings, my family sometimes said, I haven't had so much fun since the horse kicked father. (laughs) (laughs) Poor dad. Yeah, and that reminded me of the one that I heard growing up, which was, I haven't had so much fun since the hogs ate my little brother up. No. (laughs) They would, too. Hogs can be mean. (laughs) Yeah, you know that from experience, right? (laughs) Absolutely. A lot of people chimed in with their own versions that they'd heard. Ken Jones said that his family said, I haven't had so much fun since the barn burnt down. And Sarah Bradley said, I haven't laughed so hard since Maggie fell out of the hearse. (laughs) And these are all (laughs) usually said when you didn't really think it was funny. You know, maybe maybe it's sarcastic. Maybe it's ironic. Or both. It's sometimes genuinely mm-hmm. sad and sometimes sarcastically sad. Mm-hmm. Well, we haven't had so much fun since the last time you called us. So pick up the phone, <laughs> 877-929-9673. That's toll-free in the U.S. and Canada. Everyone else can talk to us on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D or email us, words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Dexter Strong calling from Huntsville, Alabama. Hi, Dexter. Welcome to the show. Thank you. What would you like to talk with us about? So um, we got married. I got married about a year and a half ago. And my my wife is from the Midwest. She's from Minnesota. And she calls um, our conversations a rhetorical adventure because they are littered (laughs) with southern idioms and phrases that she just never heard. Um, And I, I, I sprinkle in southern vernacular and black vernacular into all our conversations like indiscriminately and she just she just has never heard many of the phrases that i use and once this was early when we were dating um she sneezed and instinctively i said scat cat and she looked at me with this puzzled face she said what what did you just say to me i said well scat cat (laughs) and it's a phrase that i'd always grown up with uh my mom ever since i was young uh, each time I sneezed, she said scat cat um, more frequently than she said bless you. And I'm wondering where that phrase comes from. Uh-huh. And did you both grow up in uh, Alabama then? My mom grew up in Shelbyville, Tennessee, which mm-hmm. is um, about, I think about 70 to 80 miles um, northeast of Huntsville, which is kind of like in the Tennessee Valley right on the border. Outside of my mom. I have never heard anybody else say that. Uh, my dad didn't say it growing up. Um, but my mom always said that. So I'm wondering where that phrase comes from. Well, Dexter, this makes a lot of sense to us because it's pretty much across the southern United States. And there are lots of different versions of it. And you just say scat cat, right? Yep, scat cat. <laughs> yep. <laughs> But there are lots and lots of different versions of this. There's scat cat, your tail's on fire. Scat there, your son bit your tail off. Scat Tom, your tail is on fire. Uh, Scat cat, get your tail out of the gravy. And scat cat, get your tail out of the butter. There are a whole lot of variations of this, different elaborations of this expression. We're not really sure where it comes from, although it might have to do with that old superstition that a sneeze is some kind of evil spirit uh, leaving your body. You know, and you just want want that that thing to get out of there. Wow. All of those phrases, different responses to sneezes that you just enumerated, all of those. Yeah, mm-hmm. that is interesting. I always assumed that it had something to do with cats being, I don't know, something that people were allergic to. Well, that's another possibility for sure. I never thought that my mom was kind of symbolically warding off an evil spirit every time I sneezed. But no. now I thank you for it. Yeah, maybe not, but it's uh, the expressions lasted so long that whatever it was in the beginning, it may not be that thing now. So she might have just 
learned it without any kind of. Oh no, my mom's super superstitious. So oh, I is could... she? <laughs> <laughs> So this, if it's linked to some type of um, cat superstition, <laughs> I'm almost positive she means it almost. Maybe not literally, but playing her cards safe. Yeah, so it goes back to at least the late 1800s, although surely it's older than that. So she's part of more than a 100-plus year tradition of, of, of this particular bit of idiom. So, Dexter, what does your wife say when somebody sneezes? Bless you. If she uh-huh. doesn't say ill. Now that we're in the age of COVID. <laughs> and and why did we say bless you when people sneeze? It's a similar reason, right? Because that association with there's something unnatural happening in the body. And that you need... Interesting, yeah. Yeah, you need blessing in order to make sure that nothing bad happens. Yeah, same idea with the German word Gesundheit, which just means health. Mm. Or, you know, in Spanish, salud. You know, you're wishing somebody well. But I, I'm just I'm just loving the idea of your rhetorical adventures. You'll have to let us know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Keep us up to date on those. <laughs> Dexter, thanks for calling. We really appreciate it. Thank you for explaining this. I can't wait to tell my wife that um, I'm not as weird as she thinks I am. Oh, absolutely not. Well, you <laughs> well, might be, but not for yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Take care. Bye-bye. We'd love to hear about your rhetorical adventures with a partner or friend or co-workers. Give us a call, 877-929-9673. Recently, I've read a couple of references to electric eels, and that got me wondering, how do they work? And that led me to stumble into a lovely little volume called The Book of Eels. It's by Patrick Svensson, translated from the Swedish by Agnes Bruma. And it's a fascinating mix of natural history and metaphysics and metaphor. And it has all these surprising anecdotes about eels. Like, for example, did you know that when he was 17 years old, Sigmund Freud, as a young medical student, was sent to Italy to dissect 400 eels to try to figure out their reproductive systems? I mean, I did not know that. <laughs> it's just kind of amazing stuff. And and uh, there are other historical figures in there, like Rachel Carson and Aristotle. And even the author of the Book of Eels describes it as a very strange and nerdy book. But even so, it won Sweden's most prestigious literary prize. So I'm glad I read it, but I was about three quarters of the way through the book when I was wondering, when is he going to talk about electric eels And it turns out that electric eels are an entirely different animal. They don't have anything to do with the eel. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Electrophorus electricus is not an eel, but a knife fish. Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) A little lesson in in how one word might not mean what you think it means. But it was a cool book to read in any case. (laughs) Yeah, misnomers. Common names versus Latin names. It's a thing. Exactly. (laughs) What are you reading? What have you learned? Share it with us, 877-929-9673. Hello, you have a way with words. Um, hi there, Martha. Hi, Grant. Um, I'm Jen Wassenberg in Omaha, Nebraska. Hi, Jen. Hi, Jen. What's up? What's on your mind? Well, um, I was calling because I was talking to my dad about a, for, well, I was talking to him and he used a phrase or an idiom that uh, was not on your tin type. Not on your tin type. Yeah, and I had no idea what that meant or never heard it before. Um, and so I thought I would call the experts. How did that conversation go? Yeah, so um, we I was talking to him, telling him a very overdramatic, long story um, involving a friend. And when I was done, I said, what do you think I should do? And he said, basically, not on your tin type would I begin to offer advice on this. Um, <laughs> which I felt like was rude, but I didn't know why. Because <laughs> I didn't yeah. know what not on your tin type meant. <laughs> Um, so when I asked him, he said, not on your life. So I, I confirmed, check, it was rude. Um, and uh, But then he didn't really have any additional clarification or idea of what a tin type was or where that phrase originated or anything like that. So um, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, he's right that not on your tin type is synonymous with not on your life, which means no way, okay. no how. Um, okay. A tin type, neither one of you knew what a tin type was? No. So my best guess was obviously something invaluable if it equates to your life. Um, But I was thinking printing press for some reason popped into my head. Um, So many valuable pieces there. Um, He thought, I think, photography of some sort. 
um, but that was the best that either of us could even get close to. Yeah, it's an old photographic method used in the mid-1800s. It was uh, the kind of thing that you would get taken at tourist sites, maybe fairs or, or public attractions, because it was relatively instant. The photos could be processed in just a few minutes. And because they were made with a backing of, of iron, not tin usually, um, they weren't very uh -huh. fragile, not like the glass-based daguerreotypes. So you could carry them around, get your photo taken, come back a few minutes later, and there was a photo of you, um, you know, at the beach or in the fair or whatever. And it was, it was nice. Oh, um, also fun. called ambrotype or milanotype, stanotype, ferrotype, bunch of names for that. I don't know why people are betting on their tin type. I have never <laughs> tur determined that. <laughs> Apparently, they were not that expensive, relatively speaking, but they were precious once you had them because photos were were unusual. So they might sure. be the kind of thing that you would take and maybe give to your sweetie or that you would put in or near the family Bible, that sort of thing. Okay. All right, so neither invaluable nor made of tin, but I mean, uh, still for somehow means not in life. Precious, sent sentimentally precious, you know, kind of thing okay. that you would appreciate because you and people you love are in the in the tin type. Oh, okay, all right, that makes a lot more sense. All right, um, is it a common phrase by any chance, or used often anymore at all? Not really. I wonder if he picked it up from his reading. Uh, it's a, it dates back to at least the 1860s. Uh, you'll yeah, find it does it feel dated. Yeah, really. Cause yeah. It takes, uh -huh. I mean, tintypes had a little bit of a comeback as people do retro photography, and they really it still okay. really works very well. And it's, it's got a such a luscious deep black look to it, just this clear black mm. and yeah, it's just wonderful to look at. But um, yeah, it's pretty dated. Maybe he picked it up from reading historical fiction because it is often used in uh, in historical fiction. Yeah, he is a very, very avid reader, and he often um, peppers his speech with uh, just very colorful idioms or colloquialisms, um, mm -hmm. quotes and things like that. And I know he does read a lot of historical fiction as well. So that would definitely make sense. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful. Okay. Well, Jen, thank you so much for calling. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you both. It's such a pleasure. All right. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jen. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Uh -huh. Bye. Call us, 877-929-9673, or send your questions and stories about language to words at waywardradio.org. In Dutch, there's a great expression that means, oh, he's all talk and no action, or he's all hat and no cattle. In Dutch, you say the equivalent of they're selling fried air. Hebache ah. lucht. I just I love that. What is it in Dutch? Hebache lucht. Something like that. I mean, <laughs> my Dutch isn't what it should be. <laughs> but in fact, it's practically non-existent. But um, yeah, they're selling fried air. Oh, that's good. And it's got the nice correspondence to hot air in English. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org. This episode is brought to you by Smart Food. What makes Smart Food so smart? It's air pop popcorn. Tossed in white cheddar cheese, only 70 calories per cup. A notorious black bag of popcorn deliciousness. You are what you eat. Welcome to the Smart Club. Shop now at snacks.com. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Martha Barnett. And I'm Grant Barrett, and here he is with a feather in his cap and a glint in his eye, our quiz guide, John Chinesky. Uh, you know, as a puzzle guy, it would, uh, it, it would be remiss of me to ignore the big thing that's going on. Everybody's into Wordle. It's sort of a combination of mastermind uh, as a word game. You take a guess of a word, and it tells you how many letters you have in the right position and how many are in, uh, or not in the right position and how many you have wrong. And through process of uh, deduction, you try to deduce the correct word. You guys have played Wordle, yes? Oh, yes, definitely. Oh, Couple good, times. good. Now, if you're lucky when playing Wordle, uh, your penultimate guess is a word with three letters in the correct position and two letters switched. Easy peasy, right? Three greens and two yellows. Mm -hmm. Sure, I'll give you a word. Two of the letters can switch places to make the goal word, 
but which letters those are are for you to determine. So here we go. Just like in the standard game, these are not just strings of letters. They're Scrabble legal five-letter words, all right? Here we okay. go. All right. Now, first off, I'll, I'll hit you right in the midsection with the word waste. W-A-I-S-T, waste. Tell mm -hmm. me which two letters to switch and what word that makes. Hmm, that's not hmm. twist. Remember, you're only switching two letters. Right. Weights, right. I see. That's it. Oh. Okay, <laughs> yes. Well, I hope you're satisfied. The word is sated. S-A-T-E-D. Sated. Tased? Uh, that's a fine word. I'm not sure if that's a Scrabble legal word. I think it's a, it might be a capitalized, uh, you know, trademark name, but uh, yeah. that's not what I was going for. Let's I'm say you're, sure you're right. But yeah. Well, what else can you get from sated? Uh, sated. Mm. Okay. Your colors are yellow, green, 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 yellow. Oh, dates. 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 Yes. Very good. Now, use it to insert a letter. The word is carrot, C-A-R-E-T, carrot. C-A-R-E-T. Cater. Cater, yes, exactly. Ah, okay. Green, green, uh, green, green, yellow, green, yellow. Cater, C-A-T-E-R. Now, careful, it's explosive. The word is nitro, N-I-T-R-O, nitro. Intro. Yes, I should have begun with the intro. That's very good. <laughs> From nitro to intro, switching the N and the I to intro. Now, go buy yourself a clue. In Sri Lanka, the word is rupee, R-U-P-E-E. -E. Puree. Yes, puree. <laughs> Delicious. Finally, you finally worked your way through this whole thing. The word is slogs, S-L-O-G-S, -S, slogs. Can you do gloss? Yes, you can do gloss. Oh. That is the perfect answer. That was the answer I was going for. <laughs> Nicely like, done. <laughs> this yeah? feels like trying to dictate on my phone and all the autocorrect you know, <laughs> yes, words. Exactly. <laughs> sort of like what you're saying. <laughs> now we've done it. We've done the Wordle thing, and we've put it to bed. Congratulations, you guys. You were fantastic. You did it in a very few number of moves. Nicely done. Thanks, John. We'll talk to you next time. Take care. Thanks, John. And we'd love to talk with you about language, so give us a call, 877-929-9673, or send your stories about your experiences with language to words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hello, my name is Julia Suddeth, and I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. Hey, Julia, welcome to the show. Hi, Julia. What Thank can we do you. for you? I'm interested in the expression, ta-da, and how that came about was, um, my husband and I are both at the age where we're losing words, and sometimes the words have just gone, and sometimes we know them, but we can't speak them. And so he has come up with this expression where he says, ta-da, and we were with our grandson who just turned three, and he is gaining words. And so when we say something and he doesn't know what it means, he says, what does that mean? And he asked me that when Mike said, ta-da to him about something. He said, what does grandpa mean? And I was trying to figure it out. And I, and I have, I've thought about it for the last couple of months. And I think what Mike is saying is I have something that I needed to do and I've done it successfully. So like if he's climbed up the stairs to go see Jesse at Jesse's house, and Jesse opens the door, Mike will say to him, ta-da, like, <laughs> I've arrived, you know, right. or yesterday morning when I was getting him up, and he opened his eyes, and, and he said to me, ta-da. <laughs> so I think that's what he means, but I don't know <laughs> what that means to other people. <laughs> right. Do, is, are there any associations in your mind with performers, professional performers? Oh, with that word? No, I had never heard it, and it's not something that he used to say, he only has started saying it within the last few months as he's having more and more trouble saying what he wants to be saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, no, I, I hadn't, I'm, I'm not familiar with that expression at all. Yeah, that kind of aphasia can be frustrating, but it sounds like he's found a, a pretty decent solution to his problem for now. I hope, I hope it uh, works out in the end. Um, yeah. 
ta-da. So it, what it does is it imitates the sound of a musical flourish meant to embellish the big finish of a performance, like the big moment of a reveal in a magical act. A lot of people associate with that. So it's like it's supposed to represent a short note and a long note. So it's us imitating instruments. So the instrument would actually perform those two notes however mm -hmm. that would sound. Yeah. Oh. Horns, maybe. Yeah, I'm thinking of trumpets. Mm -hmm. trumpets. Or trumpets. Interestingly, the, the first use we know of tada in print, spelled T-A-D-A-A, -A, with no hyphen, is about a music act where the, the <laughs> there's this magician, this conjurer, tells the orchestra that he doesn't like what they're doing, and he says he wants something, you know, he's disgusted with their performance. He says, I want a tada from you. And so at the moment that they're supposed to give him a tada, instead of playing their instruments, they all shout out loud, tada! <laughs> <laughs> Just to irritate him further, I guess. Um, That's so funny. I can't imagine where Mike would ever have heard that, though. It's really pervasive in our culture, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, when I do improv and we play games um, among ourselves on the team, um, you know, the idea of the game is to just go faster and faster until somebody screws up. And we we have embraced that ta-da, you know, and if you're the one who screws up in this game, you just say ta-da, and it's, it, it's a way of embracing that mistake, and, and it almost sounds like that's yeah. sort of what your husband is doing as well, you know? Except that he's he's not saying I messed up, he's saying I did it correctly. Well, yeah. 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 So, it's, so it's kind of the opposite um, idea. That's that's so huh. interesting. Huh. But he he is claiming what he just did. Yeah, like he's voila. claiming what he just did. Yeah, yes, voila. yes, like voila, right? Um, <laughs> except that he doesn't know French either. Um, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, he is definitely claiming that he just did something that was of some significance to somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Judith, yeah. thank you for sharing this little tidbit of your life. Love is a, such a thank healer, you. isn't it? Love is Im very important. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Take well, care. Well, thank now. you for, for sure. letting me be on. That was fun. All right. Bye bye. Thanks, Julia. Bye-bye. 877-929-9673 is the magic number. Or you can email us, words at waywardradio.org. We read everything, and we love to hear from you. You can also talk to us on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Holler, who lives just north of Asheville, North Carolina, wrote us to say, I was reading Simon Winchester's The Professor and the Madman, and he used the phrase piling Pelion upon Asa. With no further explanation, he evidently assumed his readers would get the illusion. He wanted an explanation for what pile Pelion on Asa means, and it means to make an already difficult situation even more difficult by adding an extra task, and it's an allusion to Greek mythology. It involves two mountains in Greece called Pelion, P-E-L-I-O-N, and Asa, O-S-S-A, and there are various versions of this myth, but basically there were these two nine-year-old giants who stood 40 feet tall, and they decided that they were going to declare war on the gods. So they got this bright idea to get up to the heavens to fight the gods by piling Mount Asa on top of Mount Olympus and then Mount Pelion on top of everything so they could climb up there. So the expression to pile Pelion on Asa is sort of the story of what happens when you have two out-of-control nine-year-old boys. Yeah, when I saw that email, I had never heard that either. So I was delighted to look into that and learn that as well. We're always grateful when you send us down an interesting etymological rabbit hole. And you can do that by sending your emails to words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Oh, hello. This is Kristen. I'm calling from Cincinnati. Hi, Hi Kristen. Kristen. Welcome to the show. Hi. Well, I was just wondering, um, you know, I lived in the UK for many years, nearly three decades, um, mostly in the south of England, in Sussex. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a particular word for the little footpaths, public footpaths that run between sort of houses and shops, um, 
maybe as a sort of a shortcut from one street to another, if the streets were parallel, or maybe from your street um, between some houses and public buildings to um, where the shops were or something like that. And we called them Twittens down south. And I know up in Yorkshire, where my friends live, they call them Ginnels up there. Um, But since I've moved back to Cincinnati four years ago, um, I've noticed these around the city. And there's even one on my street that cuts through from my street between two houses to a park where the um, elementary school is. But there aren't any particular name for them. And I've I've discussed this with a few of my friends. And I was just wondering if that if there are any sort of regional names in the United States for those kind of um, public footpaths that are just shortcuts from one street to another or something like that. Yeah, I grew up uh, down the Ohio River a little ways from there in in Louisville, and I think we just called them alleys, honestly. Yeah, Yeah. alleys. Alleys sometimes, yeah. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, to me, an alley runs behind um, a house, and it's actually Mm -hmm. a place where you could drive your car, but these Mm -hmm. are strictly just for people to walk on. Right. Mm -hmm. I think most Americans, if they had to, if they were in the UK and they had to name that, they would probably call it an alley, though, mm-hmm. even mm-hmm. if it were a more mm-hmm. formal. But alleys mm-hmm. take so many different kind of appearances in the United States. But so let's spell Ginnell and Twitten for everyone. So Twitten is T W I T T E N from the south of mm-hmm. England. That's in Sussex, mm-hmm. and Ginnell is G I N N E L, northern England, and in Scotland. But those aren't mm-hmm. the only terms for those uh, those paths. Mm-hmm. In England, there's mm-hmm. chair, which is C-H-A-R-E, and snicket mm-hmm. in northern England. Yeah, mm-hmm. snicket, uh, snicket, snicket I've heard of, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. sometimes gully or tin foot or gentle, uh, spelled as another version of the gentle, and uh, jigger and jitty. Mm-hmm. And in Scotland, you uh-huh. might have a wind, W-Y-N-D. Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. So there's a bunch of them yeah, in the I've UK. Re- I really had only ever heard snicket, yeah, that's interesting. You know, I'm with Martha. I think we would all call it an alley, but we do have a wide variety of names for other, for trails and paths. And I'm thinking of the kind that are more casual and less maintained, which is why I asked you that question. I'm thinking about Mm. things like hog paths or deer runs or pig trails, cow trails, deer trails. So these are, even if they're not made by those animals, they look like they were. They're just you know, small paths worn by people from one place to uh-huh. another. Uh-huh. And we've uh-huh. also talked about desire paths mm-hmm. where people cut across a, a lawn or, or, you know, a grassy area on a college campus, and, and that's called a desire path. Right. So there's no concrete there. So they cut a, they cut a corner off, and then over time it just turns into dirt with grass on either side. Um, mm-hmm. Used to, I don't know if they still do, but in Chicago... This is a term closer to what you're asking for, Kristen. A passage between buildings was sometimes called a gangway in Chicago. And the Dictionary of American Regional English says it was formerly widespread. But again, I don't know if that's still widely used in Chicago. Some of our listeners will let us know, no doubt. But again, a lot of the words that we have are are about the outdoors in general and outside of urban areas. We might find senderos in Texas or in the southwest, bajadas. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's interesting. Right. Mm. I've never heard any of those. <laughs> well, trace. Let's not forget trace. Like trace, I mean, when you read old writing about the settlement of the West and the move westward, trace comes up again and again and again in fiction uh, and nonfiction for paths or uh, trails that, that, that people take. That's something I've seen here in Ohio, actually. The, um, I never knew what it meant, but there's sort of some housing developments and stuff around I've seen that such and such trace, like Sycamore Trace. Mm-hmm. There we go. Yep. It's a mm-hmm. path or a trail. Oh. Kristen, that's really interesting. It sounds like your experience in the UK versus your experience in the US is uh, going to generate a lot of questions that we would love to hear in the future. So keep our phone number handy, will you? Okay. Thank you. It's a very right, interesting show. I really enjoy it. Thank Thanks. you. Oh, great. All right. Be well. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. What do you call those paths in your part of the country? Let us know, 877-929-9673, or send us your thoughts about language to words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. 
Hi, Grant and Martha. This is Jane Kenyon in Tippecanoe County, Indiana. Hi, Jane in Tippecanoe County. Yes, hi. I have a question that came to my mind when I was reading a book by Kinky Friedman. The book is Armadillos and Old Lace, and he used a phrase, crazy as a Betsy bug, the name Betsy, several times in the book, and then it made me remember that as a child I remember saying crazy as a bed bug. So my questions are, who is this poor Betsy, and how did she come to be associated with craziness and bugs, and how do we know that bed bugs are crazy? (laughs) (laughs) Wow, that's quite a list, Jane. (laughs) Well, I'm sure you can answer them. Have you ever had an experience with bed bugs? No, I just remember, don't let the bed bugs bite when we went to bed. (laughs) Right. Well, I haven't either, but if you see video of them, they they move around in a kind of erratic way. And and I guess they also have an effect on the bed owner, too, right? (laughs) Oh, Oh, I bet. (laughs) Sounds uh, like lots of itching. Yes. Um, I would say that the far more interesting insect here, though, is the Betsy bug that you mentioned. Um, It goes by lots and lots of different names, particularly in the South, like Bess bug or Bessie bug or Best Betty or Betsy Beetle. They're sometimes called patent leather beetles. They've got this glossy back um, that does make them look like patent leather, and they're an inch or two long, and they usually live in decaying logs. And they're super interesting in terms of the insect world because they're a kind of rarity in that they live as families. The, the parents look after the eggs until they hatch, and then they feed the little ones. And, and it's, it's really unusual in the insect world. But they also make 14 different kinds of sounds um, that are usually a kind of hissing or wheezing, or, or some people think it actually sounds like the word Bessie. Um, if you disturb them. Uh, the technical mm. term for that is stridulation, um, which uh, comes from a Latin word that uh, means to make a harsh noise. It's like our word strident. So it's really the sound that makes us or the bugs seem crazy. <laughs> In the case of the Betsy bugs, for sure. Well, thank you. That's uh, very interesting, and I learned something from you as well as from Kinky Friedman. <laughs> <laughs> We're in good company. You can always learn from Kinky. (laughs) So thank you for the enlightenment and the fun. Take care, Jane. All righty. Bye-bye. All righty. Bye-bye. Well, you know when you're reading and you highlight that passage or you write it down on a note and you say, I'm going to look that up later and find out what that means. Well, sometimes you don't and sometimes you do. And sometimes you call Away With Words to find out. 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org or Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. A few weeks ago, we had a conversation about elevator terminology. You know, it's technical language like door dwell, which is the amount of time that it takes for the door to close after you board an elevator, and terminal landing, which is the top and bottom elevator landing area. But it struck me as poetic, and and I was saying, wouldn't it be great if somebody wrote a poem about it? Well, somebody did. We heard from LaDonna Arada, who listens to uh, Away With Words in Cuna, Idaho, along with her son Jojo, and she wrote to us to say that she was thinking about how an elevator could be a metaphor for life, and she sent this really lovely sonnet using some of that language, and oh, I wanted to share. Oh, isn't it the best? Isn't it just yes. gorgeous? Yes. I know you enjoyed it as well, Grant, mm-hmm. and I'd love to share it with everybody else. Is called Terminal Landing by LaDonna Arada. The gaping doors before me call me in. Transition waits beyond this bare hallway. This traveler lingers, anxious to begin, yet also hesitant and fain to stay. What lies before me? Opportunity? Or maw of beast to ferry me away? A step? A turn? A pause to choose my dream? my finger poised to punch my destiny. A breath, a gasp, a wait for the door dwell. With sigh, tis time to shed this earthen chore. No fear of fiery fiend from lower hell, perchance a hope of rest on yonder floor. 
with shudder, chariot begins to rise. What terminus awaits me in the skies? That is a metaphor for life, isn't it? And I love the mix <laughs> of the modern idea of an elevator. I mean, obviously, they're a couple mm -hmm. hundred years old, but also just this could be a 500 year old verse in some way. Some mm -hmm. of the language that she's chosen. I just love it. The mix. Yes. In sonnet form. I thought it Punch was gorgeous. Punch my destiny. <laughs> <laughs> right? What terminus awaits. <laughs> yes. I don't think I can ever get on an elevator now, Grant, without thinking of this poem. It's every. It's going to be momentous from here on out, right? <laughs> every time I get on an elevator, I'm like, ah, something's going to happen. <laughs> Aha! Things will change. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you never know. Thank you. And her name again is? LaDonna Arada. LaDonna, thank you so much for that poem, and we will share that on our website. And if you've got something that uh, you've been inspired to write based on this show, we'd love to read it. 877-929-9673, or send it an email to words at waywardradio.org. Hi there. You have a way with words. Hi, this is John Coons. I'm calling from Waverly, New York. Well, welcome to the show, John. What's on your mind? My mother was a character. She was, uh, we all usually have somebody in our life that they have their own vocabulary. She'd have her own sayings, euphemisms, and words. And long before Ron Howard and Henry Winkler and Happy Days, she was calling us kids nerds. And I always thought that that was uh, a word that she made up. But, of course, as a teenager, I tuned into Happy Days and uh, pops out of Fonzie's mouth. So I'm kind of wondering what you might have on that. Okay, nerd. And so give me an idea. What decade are we talking about here when she would have used this? <laughs> this would have been the <laughs> early 70s. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, I was just wondering if she was, like, on the the cusp of uh, of the early slang use for this. But it sounds like she was just a little past it. it nerd meaning? Um, yeah, what did she mean? I don't remember if she specifically, you know, what we know as a nerd today. I don't remember the context. I was much too young, but I just remember okay. her calling us it. So it wasn't like, you nerds clean up your room, or you nerds, you don't know anything? <laughs> or you nerds. Oh, John, stop being a nerd. Yeah. Stop. You're not wearing that outside this house, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> well, not so threatening, but yeah. No, okay. But a, a nerd meaning somebody who's unfashionable or uncool dates back to uh, early 1950s. The earliest print use that we have is is 1951. But there's an asterisk to that, is that in 1950, the word nerd is used in a Dr. Seuss book. We don't know, word researchers and etymologists, if Dr. Seuss is the origin of the slang nerd. We just don't know. The line huh. in the book is something like, then just to show them I'll sail to Katru and bring back an itch kutch, a preep and a prue, a nurkle and nerd, and a seersucker too. And we really just don't know. This is If I Ran the Zoo by Dr. Seuss from 1950. So it's weird that a word from a kid's book would show up in teen slang. It wouldn't be impossible, but... Um, and it's very interesting that that's 1950, and then nerd shows up in 1951. Maybe teenagers read to their younger siblings. Who knows? Yeah, or or they were exposed to the word, and as they got older, it just became part of their vocabulary, maybe. Well, maybe. But again, there's like a one-year gap from when the word appears in print in Dr. Seuss, and oh, then right. starts being used right, as teen right. slang. Huh. Yeah, yeah. One other theory is that it's uh, from drunk backwards, but there's just no evidence really to support that, except that it kind of looks like it. <laughs> Silent K. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah. When I first heard that word. I I pictured it with a U rather than an E. Mm -hmm. There is a word called a nerdle, which is used for if you put the kind of wavy drop of toothpaste you put on your toothbrush is called a nerdle, or little <laughs> blips of styrofoam that are used for packing material are sometimes called nerdles. So some people, I've tried to connect those, but nerdle tends to be much later. So it sounds like your mom was uh, right there in the mix. Did she read Dr. Seuss to you as a kid? Uh, she read, but I don't, it was never Dr. Seuss. It was always okay. uh, poets and stuff. Do you think of yourself as a nerd now? Uh, in many ways, yes. I mean, I went through my teenagers, big fan of big bad music. Uh, I am a huge word nerd, grammar nerd, mm -hmm. punctuation nerd. So in a lot of ways I am, and in a lot, okay, a lot of ways yeah. I'm not. 
Yeah, well, this is a safe space for nerds. <laughs> I know. Nerds have taken over already. So Yeah. Anyway, John, that's what we know about nerd. Thank you for joining us, nerds. Well, we really I really it. appreciate your help at it. Thank you very much, and it was a pleasure being on the show. All right, take care. All now. right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Give us a call, 877-929-9673, or send your questions and stories about language to words at waywardradio.org. Charles Darwin was, of course, one of the greatest scientific minds ever, and I was interested in a line from his autobiography where he says, If I had my life to live over again, I would have made a rule to read some poetry and listen to some music at least once every week. And I don't know, Grant, that's, that's really stuck with me, the fact that uh, this brilliant scientist, you know, looking back over his life, wished that he had read more poetry. Yeah, that reminds me of something that has been making the rounds of the internet since the pandemic started. And it, it's something on the lines of just, I want you to realize what you turned to when things got tough. Mm. You turned to the arts, you turned mm. to books, you turned to movies, you turned to television, you turned to poetry, you turned to theater. And that's where you go when life needs to be explained or things are, are difficult. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, and all the more reason to support artists in all forms, right? Yeah. We'd love to hear what you've been reading, the poetry, the literature, 877-929-9673, or tell us about it on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Hello, you have a way with words. Hello, my name is Christine. I'm calling from Santa Cruz, California, and I really enjoy your show. Thank you okay. very much. Um, I have a question. Uh, my father sailed all over the world um, in the 1930s and 40s, and then later we had a family boat and sailed up and down the West Coast. And he used to say something uh, frequently to us um, that I think came from his sailing experiences, but he would say, I've seen the elephant and heard the owl. And to me, that meant you can't pull the wool over my eyes. <laughs> you know, I've been there. Mm -hmm. But I don't know really the origins of that saying. And I just wondered if you had any history or experience with seeing it in other places. I have not. So, Christine, when he said, I've seen the elephant and I've heard the owl, what was happening? Were you trying to fib uh, as a kid? No, nothing like that. I mean, I think he was um, just more saying... I've, I've, I've had that experience. So I don't know. It was just something he said regularly to gotcha. imply that he's had a lot of world experience, which he right. Has. He's worldly. Mm -hmm. that, that makes a lot of sense. And that is the way that I've seen it too, that he's experienced in the ways of the world. Or sometimes you see it a little, a little different where somebody says I'm up to date or I'm informed or I'm no greenhorn, you know, I'm, I'm no spring chicken, meaning that uh, I, I've got some years under my belt, and I know how things work. And maybe he meant some of that, too. Yeah, like, this is not my first rodeo. <laughs> yeah, not my first but rodeo, exactly. Do, do you have a, any origins for that term? Or we that do. Thing? As a matter of fact, absolutely we do. And I think you're going to love this. Those are both separate expressions. I've seen the elephant, and I've heard the owl. I've heard the owl. We don't know very much about at all. It dates back to around the 1930s. It pops up in... Western fiction, you know, cowboy stories, and it might have just been invented for those. There's some some idea that it might come from Native American tales, but it's hard to sort out how much of that was invented by um, white people making up Native American tales and how much of it was authentic. It's really difficult to untangle that mess. But we know it's from the 1930s. However, seeing the elephant, we know a lot of bit about that. This is an American version of an expression uh, that actually goes back to the 1500s. The American version starts in the 1830s, um, but the the, uh, the version before that is to have seen the lions. And this is probably a reference to a menagerie that was kept at the Tower of London. From about the year 1200 onward, there were all kinds of strange creatures kept at the Tower of London. Polar bear, lions, leopards, ostriches, monkeys, and other creatures. 
So if you had seen the Lions, you had been to London, which, of course, was a, a major world city, and it meant that you were worldly just to be in London. But also you had seen these strange creatures from other parts of the world. You you knew some stuff that anybody from the, the boonies or the sticks or the bush hadn't, you know, didn't know. Um, and and likely by the time I had you know I've seen the I've seen the lion made it to the United States, the lion was replaced with an elephant because in, in the U.S. Um, you were more likely to have seen an elephant say in, in a traveling circus. Right, huh? That's really interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the research, and um, um, your program is fabulous and fascinating, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Christine. Take care now. Bye bye. Bye bye. And the term to see the elephant um, was often associated with having seen military combat, right? I mean, mm-hmm. the, that's right. In some instances of that uh, that expression, it's it's a it's a world weary, weariness too. It's not you know I'm so smart or I'm right. I'm no greenhorn, but uh, but I've I've seen a lot of the world. I've been yeah I've been I've seen the elephant and I'm done with it. A lot of times it was like, uh, you know, I'm not doing this again. I'm I'm finished. Eight seven seven nine two nine nine six seven three. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, my name is Veronica. Where are you calling from, Veronica? San Diego, California. Oh, San Diego, I know it well. You must be just. <laughs> you must be neighbors. <laughs> we are indeed. <laughs> what is going on? Well, my brother and I are were raised with my mom, and she was taught from a young age to leave what is called an ort on your plate asked for dinner. So it's an basically ort. a small, yes, O-R-T. It's basically a small piece of your meal. Uh, and she said it was dinner etiquette. And we have no idea where it's from. My grandmother's sisters had never heard it before either. So it's kind of a family mystery that my brother and I really would love to know the answer to. Before we get into this, let me ask you, Veronica, do you also leave an ort on your plate now as an adult as a bit of etiquette at dinner? It's something I think about. I don't necessarily know if I'm very proactive with it, but mm-hmm. it is something that crosses my mind. How interesting. So an ort being the last little bit of food on your plate. Correct. Well, it turns out that the word ort is a really old word. It's been around since at least the 15th century. And in Middle English, it referred to the fodder that farm animals haven't yet eaten. Um, you know, the stuff that they leave behind. And it may come from a Dutch word, we don't know, meaning to, to leave behind. But uh, ort is an old, old word that means a fragment or a leftover, as you said. And it's been used uh, metaphorically by lots of different writers over the years. Virginia Woolf uh, famously wrote about scraps, orts, and fragments. And in fact, Shakespeare used the word ort uh, a couple of times in his work, talking about the orts of someone's love, meaning, you know, the last little bits of it. And D.H. Lawrence wrote about orts and slarts. Slarts is an old word that means uh, leftovers as well. And I'm interested that that she talked about it in terms of um, being uh, mannerly, because sometimes we call that last little piece the manners bit, the idea being that you don't ever want your host to think that they didn't make enough food for you. So you always leave a little bit. Yeah, that little manners bit. Okay, well, that would totally make sense then. Yeah, Yeah, or, or the manners piece, or sometimes even it's just called... The manners, you might say, don't take the manners or I'll mm. eat the manners or, okay. or leave the manners in the dish. But I'm really interested that the word ort uh, survived in your family because we really don't hear it that much. We usually see it. If you do a lot of crossword puzzles, it's a really handy word for crossword puzzles. Oh, good to know. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that explanation. It does put the rest of family mystery. Thanks for calling, Veronica. We appreciate it. <laughs> Glad to thank do you. it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm thinking about Martha's Orts. You had a blog at one time, Martha's Orts. Yeah, about 100 years ago. I had <laughs> <laughs> Back when blogs were a thing. I think it must have been like 2004, 2006, something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I had a blog called Martha Barnett's Orts, which were the, you know, the leftovers, the things that, uh, that I was researching that uh, I didn't have any place else to put. Yeah, maybe a 
a, your commonplace, right? Your commonplace blog was a place to put your orts. Yes. <laughs> a language and culture and folklore and custom, they all go hand in hand. And we'd love to hear the intersection of those things in your world, no matter where you are in the world. 877-929-9673 is toll-free in the U.S. and Canada. Or you can write us an email, words at waywardradio.org. Hey, Grant, why can't you trust atoms? This is a pun. <laughs> what? How dare I? <laughs> why pun? can't I trust atoms? Yeah. Because um, they're always eating fruit given to them by Eve? I don't know. <laughs> no, atoms, A-T-O-M. A-T-O-M, because um, uh, just when you need them, they'll split. <laughs> <laughs> I like that better than my answer. My answer was, they make up everything. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. They make up everything. I remember that one. 877-929-9673. <laughs> Our team includes senior producer Stephanie Levine, engineer and editor Tim Felton, production assistant Rachel Elizabeth Weisler, and quiz guy John Chinesky. We'd love to hear from you no matter where you are in the world. Go to waywardradio.org slash contact. Subscribe to the podcast, hear hundreds of past episodes, and get the newsletter at waywardradio.org. Whenever you have a language story or question, our toll-free line is open in the U.S. and Canada, 1-877-929-9673. Or send your thoughts to words at waywardradio.org. Away With Words is an independent production of Wayward, Inc., a nonprofit supported by listeners and organizations who are changing the way the world talks about language. Special thanks to Michael Breslauer, Josh Eccles, Claire Grotting, Bruce Rogo, Rick Seidenworm, and Betty Willis. Thanks for listening. I'm Martha Barnett. And I'm Grant Barrett. Until next time, goodbye. Bye.